know what's going to happen on a canoe trip. What we thought was going to be easy today, it's not. We actually paddled, we've been going on for probably from nine in the morning, now it's about one, and we've only made about four kilometers. So what's up, Andy? Well, water's really high and uh, so high that it's washed out the uh, bottom end of the portage to make it really not reachable. There's the water's flushing through so fast it would be dangerous to take out on, on that side of the river. So we came over to this side of the river and we've uh, flagged a bushwhack trail to get around this drop in the river. So our friend Mr. Flagging Tape has uh, come through for us. And fortunately it's been uh, not too bad, not too many deadfalls to clear out of the way. And it's uh, really pretty when you get up onto the top of the hill you can see down into the water below. You can see the next falls upstream. So uh, a little bit of extra work, but uh, uh, a nice diversion if, uh, if you roll with the punches. Well, hello everybody. <laughs> you always need more cowbell, just saying. All right, so another presentation virtually. No more handshake, hugging, meeting the crowd, wearing something fancy on the stage instead of track pants while you're doing the Zoom. <laughs> Darn it. All right. So I'm actually looking forward to this one. Uh, it, it is the Lost Canoes. And uh, I wrote a book in 2002, I think, um, Lost Canoes. Written a couple books for the publisher at the time. They did really well. And I came up with this idea saying, hey, you know, we should tell everybody where all these lost canoe routes are in Ontario. And I remember the publisher, John Dennison, really good guy, really nice guy. And uh, he goes, who would buy that? <laughs> and I went, well, you know, it really doesn't matter who buys it. It's, it's more important to protect these routes that are being lost. Because really, like, um, the, the, these, these routes, if nobody pals them, they're going to do something with them. We all know that. The government's going to do something with them forestry, mining, whatever. So they have to keep up as a canoe route for them to be saved. And he's like, yep, uh, we're a business and who's gonna buy this book? And I went, hey, you know what? <laughs> and I actually admire uh, John uh, th to this day for that. I, I said, he kind of owe me, man. Like I I've written a whole bunch of routes and the last one was on, on Southern Ontario and everybody's gonna paddle those routes. So just, just th throw me the bone and just like, can I just at least start working on it? And he said, yeah, uh, let's, let's do it. This thing has sold a lot. And I know why. But uh, so I'm going to present on, on those routes that I talked about. My idea was to promote those routes that were lost at the time in 2002. And then I'm going to sh you know, show you whether they're still lost, because some are completely still lost, and some are not. Some are really well-known popular routes. So I'm going to show you those. There's lots more that I've done and lots more other people have done, but I'm just going to concentrate on that one book. All right. So to start off, I'm going to share the screen. Are you ready? All right, I'm ready. Okay. A powder's guide to, let me see if I can move my little square thing here. There we go. Whoop, whoop. I, just, I just moved myself. It's like magic. All right, uh, Powder's Guide to Ontario's Lost Canoe Routes. And uh, actually, on the far lower left there, that's uh, Noel Hudson. He's the editor uh, of, or was, uh, of, during the time of Boston Mills. And yeah, I, I took him on the, on the one lost route, and I think that's the last time him and I, him and I paddled. <laughs> Just saying. Okay, so yeah. The original book, Lost Canoe Roots, came out in 2002, and it was black and white photos, not like my other guidebooks. And basically because they're like, we're not sure if this is going to sell, Kevin, so, you know, uh, we'll do it on the cheap. And I went, yeah, great. I just want it out. I just want to promote these routes. That's my purpose, whatever. And I get my 8% royalty and whatever. Welcome to Canadian Publishing. So, but... Later on, I forget the year this came out, probably a couple years later, it did so well, they brought it back uh, out in color. <laughs> so there you go. Interesting. Hmm. I'm going to go over a whole bunch of uh, routes that are in the book, uh, show basically how they're doing and how they're not doing. 
that sort of thing, but lots of interesting routes to, to explore in Ontario. I'm going to go from west to east. So I'm going to start off in Wabakimi and go all the way down to the uh, York River in, near Bancroft. And yeah, so splatter of routes all across northern Ontario to northeastern to north central Ontario. It's just Ontario. Remember, this is back in the late 80s. For you to find any information on canoe routes during that time, probably like how Wilson's book was out uh, on Tomogamy, but other than that, you actually had to, this is before Google, remember that. This is before the internet. You had to go and look at books at the library. And I remember going to Nick Nichols. And amazing uh, books. He, he would just record all these routes that were available in Ontario. And then you would find out about them. And it was not easy. You have to write a letter, write a letter, to each district uh, office of the MNR and ask about them. And maybe you would get a phone call back, but mostly you would get a letter back, which would may take like a month, whatever. So you better, you know, at that time, to trip plan, that was, that was a lot of time. Letters, phone calls. Oh my Lord, Google did not exist. So yeah, he was the, the main source of the time. And that's where I started doing the research. I started looking at Nick Nichols uh, stuff back in the early uh, 1990s. And I thought, okay, well, so which routes are being lost and which are popular, right? And then this, this book came out. I, mean, I remember buying this book at the uh, Toronto Outdoor Adventure Show. No, no, no. It was the outdoor, oh, the, oh, the outdoor show. No, the sportsman show. The sportsman show, yeah. And I remember seeing this book on, on, on uh, the table of people selling books. I was like, cool. 100 routes, all written up by the MNR, Ministry of Natural Resources. And really, it didn't give you a lot of detail. It just sort of told you the route and then told you where to get more information on the route. So you had to write a letter again, maybe phone call, but I remember writing letters. And then a month later, you would get a letter back. And if you're lucky, you would get a pamphlet from that district on that specific canoe route. That was a canoe route. Cool. So I looked at the ones that were being lost and went from there and after that there, there were um you know certain websites like my ccr that actually i remember living off that uh, that site well i still do but not as much as in, in, back in the past where that was the, really the only site well there was Otter Tooth and one for Algonquin, and but but basically my ccr was uh the thing that you went to for information on canoes so it was a basically a community and we're all looking at those roots and getting more information than the pamphlets did or even this book that did. I mean, that Canary Roots of Ontario from the MNR really wasn't a book of detail. It was sort of saying, well, here's the route, here's who to write to and get more information. Imagine that. Imagine, like, right now I can actually boom, 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 in my computer and get information on a whole bunch of roots. But back then, you actually had to get a book from the library maybe buy it if you can find it and then write a letter and maybe a month or two you would get a response oh my lord cheers on that okay so i'm going to start off with the first uh route wabakimi provincial park during that time during the early 90s when i was you know going off and exploring these routes before i, I could write about them Wabakimi was on my list for, for sure. I've always wanted to go to Wabakimi because I wanted to go to Wendell Beckwith's cabin or cabins. So I'll get to that in a minute. But Wabakimi, to get information at that time was impossible. You would contact the park and, well, there were, really wasn't any park person. There was a park superintendent that was part of a whole bunch of other parks in, in the north. Uh, and I remember that person said, okay, well, you, to get information, you have to contact this outfitter up there. And then that, that person would, would provide you with information. Okay, no problem. I did. And that outfitter at the time said, yeah, uh, for 10, I think it was $10 a sheet or whatever. I remember for me to do this one route was going to cost me over a hundred bucks for me to buy these print sheets that he would mail you. And I so said, whoa, you know, if I go to Gonquin, I just get a map. Like if I go to Wabakimi and I get nothing, except now I have to give you money for a printout sheet 
And I remember the outfitter saying, well, it was me that, you know, created all these routes and therefore you should pay me. I was like, yeah, whatever. It's a park. I don't believe that. Um, nothing against outfitters whatsoever. Okay. And all the outfitters I worked with before, they know what I'm talking about, but I did not agree with that. So I just got topple maps and, uh, went out, actually brought a film producer, Kip Spidell, uh, to film and also Nancy Scott, which was a park planner at the time. Uh, I think she still is. And she knew the park and I went, well, I'll just go with them. And here we go. So we went out and, uh, you could drive to Armstrong from Thunder Bay, which I've done after the fact of going to Wapkini, a fantastic park actually. This is actually just south of James Bay, so it's far north, right? <clears throat> so, oh my God, the drive from Thunder Bay to Armstrong, that's a long drive, just warning you. It's a good drive, it's just a long drive. Or you could take the train, and eventually you have to take the train anyway to do the route that I did. You could actually go from a lake near, I think Caribou Lake near Armstrong and do a route there as well, but it's really, you know, it's not the same. Taking the train is, is far better. So I remember Kip and I, uh, and we met Nancy at Armstrong. We, we, Kip and I took the train from Union Station and uh, in Toronto. <laughs> that was interesting. That was really interesting. Taking a canoe, portaging it down the street and through, that was really kind of cool. Anyway, we took the, the train all the way there, uh, met Nancy and we headed out to Wapakimi. We did three rivers. Uh, let me see my notes here. Uh, I know the Berg and the Ogoki. What was the other one? Uh, Plantation Portage was part of it. Oh my Lord, oh, where am I? Uh, oh, by the way, we started at Schultz's Trail. So we took uh, the train and we told the train person you know, let those off at Schultz's Trail. They knew exactly what we're talking about. This might have not changed, by the way. Uh, if we contacted the real system on phone, whatever, they were like, no, you can't do that. But no, you can. Just tell the person running the train, we went off at Schultz's Trail. They knew exactly where to, to, to drop us off. So uh, we, we started out with Schultz's Trail. Um, uh, Lookout River. The Lookout River uh, Fantasia Portage, which is amazing because it's all this jack pine, boreal forest, um, caribou moss. It was just beautiful. I'm not sure. The last time I was on that trail, it was a windblown nightmare. Uh, hopefully it's fixed by then. Maybe it burned over. I'm not sure. But back then, it did look like Fantasia. So it was kind of cool. So we uh, we went down the Lookout River to Smooth Rock, big big lake. And we went down the Berg and the Goki, which is great. We went to Whitewater Lake. And then the idea, let me get to this, um, we went to film Wendell Beckwith's cabins. Okay, so there's Wabakini right there, far north, north of Lake Nipigon, north of Lake Superior, amazing place. Boreal Forest, big time, by the way, though, okay? And it's maintained more than it was before, you know, when we went. I mean, Friends of Wabakini has done an incredible amount of work uh to actually help that park out and also the park itself has has promoted a, a lot more because people are going there but it was a lost canoe route at the time i would say it's kind of somewhat lost still <laughs> but yeah all right yeah so here's the route so um uh yeah schultz's trail we went down to the lookout river to smooth rock we went to, down to the, Go or the berg and the goki river to uh whitewater lake and then we actually uh, got to uh, um, the island where Wendell Beckwith's cabin was, and we stayed there for a couple of days. Now, you could paddle back, which I had done um, after the fact. Uh, I've done that. I've paddled, paddled back to Armstrong through Caribou Lake and this whole system, too. And that's all possible. That makes a really good loop, by the way. But the camera guy we're delayed a lot for various reasons i won't even get into a lot of misadventures on this trip but um he needed to fly out because he needed to do a another film on polar bears and churchill so we actually got flown out from uh 
Whitewater Lake, Wendelbeckle's cabin, and flown back to Armstrong, and then that was the end of the trip. But you can do it as a loop. Uh, I, you're talking, if you do that whole loop, at least 10 days. I do 12 days. Uh, we were out for maybe, I, I don't remember, eight days maybe? It's a good trip though. No, it was a lot more than eight days. We're out for a long time. If you go to Wabakimi, it's not a weekend jaunt. Just saying, okay? You need to see these cabins that Wendell Beck was made, okay? They're not as good as they were when I was there. Uh, they kind of fallen apart. Nobody really is, well, maybe some people have tried. I think the First Nations there have tried to take care of them, but the park certainly hasn't. Um, I don't think they even want them in the park because they don't want the liability. Uh, that's another story, but yeah. Um, in 1955, uh, Wendell Beckwith left his family um, to seek out the center of the universe. He believed that Pi 3.14 existed on this lake. I'm not sure if that's the reason why he went there, but that, that's the whole concept. There's a really good film that just came out. Uh, it's on the website of Thunder Bay Museum. They created an amazing film on, on the history of this guy, and you really need to watch that. But yeah, in 1955, he, he sort of left there, and then he was a caretaker of the one cabin, of some architect, um, and that was his job. But then he started building other cabins. And uh, it's a great story. You, you need to look at the whole story, but... The one cabin that he built at, at the end, uh, I think it was 1978, he called it the snail. And it was an environmental cabin built into the side of that of, of the, this hill. And um, I, I remember going in there and the, the whole thing was environmentally sound beyond belief. But even the, the stove rotated with the wind. Um, it was amazing. And um, he was a mathematician and he had tons of stuff left over there. There was a telescope he tried to, to create there. There was one amazing cabin that had all the shingles mathematically precisely cut. The, the floorboards were all hexagon cubes all cut. He had, um, he had a, a, a fridge that you lowered down into the, the root cellar. Um, but yeah, so he, he lived there trying to prove all his formulas. He was one of the inventors of the ballpoint pen actually too. Um, but yeah, uh, he ended up dying in 1980 as a heart attack. I think he ate popcorn and then didn't really eat well. I think he just ate popcorn and did his mass in a snail and then he died. But check out that film. All right. To study his theories, Wendell chose Best Island, located on the far southeast bay of Whitewater Lake. Here, he built a number of log cabins, all superbly designed. The Still River Loop. This is probably still lost. Uh, actually, probably isn't because of the, the help of Rob Heslam. He's an outdoor ed instructor, uh, high school instructor uh, up there. I think he's retired now, but he would take his students and maintain this route. That was it. At, at the time, the MNR used to maintain all these routes, and that, that was when the Ontario Provincial Parks were part of the MNR, and now they're separate. But then, I mean, that didn't help matters um, in one sense. Maybe not. Maybe I don't know. But when the MNR got rid of the um, the uh, forest rangers, and that kind of wasn't good. <laughs> they should never have done that because uh, a lot of maintenance was done by them. 
but Rob, uh, yeah, he maintained that, that route and maybe he still does, but yeah, it, it, it's a lost route still. You can do this route. If you look at it, it's north of Lake Superior. You can do this route. If you look at it, you could actually forget this part here. You can actually drive up a logging road and then just do this one section of the river. And then even before you actually finish it, you can get off on a logging road there. And it was probably, you know, and it would be probably like a, a, a good five day canoe ride down a nice river. But to do the entire loop is an adventure in itself and it should be done. It's an amazing river. Okay. So the still river loop. So you start off uh, the route at Santoy Lake if you're going to do it as a loop. And watch that lake, by the way. It's, it can get really windy and it's all engulfed by cliffs. Okay. So just be very, very watchful of that lake. It can get really bad. But anyway, uh, go down Centaur Lake. I remember the first time doing this this trip, uh, I was looking for a diable portage, the double portage, and it goes from Santoy to, I forget, probably Diable Lake, I think, a little small lake, and that's your first obstacle. Oh, my Lord. That's not good. Uh, it is up a cliff like this. I literally had to put my canoe on a harness and pull it up the first part of the portage. And then you get into these sinkholes. Um, it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal. I, I remember my dog, uh, Bailey, my first dog, Springer Spaniel. She was ahead of me and she started whining. And I went and checked her out. And there was a lynx about to kill her. And uh, <laughs> brutal portage. Uh, good trout fishing in the, lake, in the lake you get to, though. So anyway, the section that you do, let me see, uh, that you do at first, you're basically going up a series of lakes. and brush portages hopefully someone has maintained them when you get there but it's well worth doing the whole loop but yeah uh do that section um but when we went there there was a a burn area which is fine it's ecology it, it happens uh, but yeah yeah so check uh jonathan's video out uh, of of this uh of this um, portage, Diablo portage. Jonathan is a great guy, uh, great, great YouTube channel, Lost Lakes Backcountry Angling. It used to be called Backcountry Angling Ontario or Ontario Backcountry Angling, and he changed, just changed the name, but check this video out. Diablo! Done. Finally. Oh, I don't know how that was only a kilometer. It felt like 10. That was awful. But the lake isn't this beautiful. So you look at the map and basically this, uh, this is a public launch. You go to Santor Lake, go up to Diablo Portage, go into Diablo Lake, I was right, and then go into a series of lakes all the way up and that will take you a few days uh how many people do this route still to this day and then you portage over into the still river itself and go down the river there's one major drop called rainbow falls gorgeous spot but the rest of it are like class twos might i always say more class ones and swiss along the way there is one place uh that i put on my my original book called lost tall rapid uh, I was drying a towel on my pack um, while we're paddling and it fell over and I lost it. So when I wrote the book up, I actually called that rapid lost tall rapid. And I was there a few years ago in the area, just having coffee at the coffee shop. And there was a map on the wall of the still river and that rapid was called lost towel rapid. So I could go to my grave knowing that I named a rapid. Just saying. Okay. So again, you could you could start here, uh, get a shuttle uh, if you want from a local outfitter, and you basically go from here all the way down the river. 
to this logging road and get out. And it's a, it's, it's a good drift. It's, it's really good. Because the bad points really are Diablo Portage, all these lakes that were burned over when I was there, um, and also the, the log jams below that in St. Toy Lake. But you really should think of it, about doing the whole loop, to be quite honest. Uh, but these log jams, they change every year. And sometimes you could float right through them, and sometimes there are even, there's even more logs blocking the way. So that's Rainbow Falls, beautiful spot, nice campsite, but the campsite's away from the falls, so yeah, I don't know. So yeah, log jams and cliff banks on the lower part, absolutely hell, hell, <laughs> worse than Diablo Portage to be quite honest. So why do it as a loop? Just to say that you did it as a loop. To be quite honest, I mean, to imagine doing a river loop, that's rare. I mean, usually you, you shuttle, right? So, yeah. Check out Northern Scavengers uh, video. Great guys, uh, Alex and Noah. They've done some amazing trips. This is one of their very first trips they did when they were young kids, uh, paddling a, uh, uh, I forget, no, it, it's a beat up canoe from King and Tire. Um, love with, that they did that. It's just, oh my Lord, I don't know how they ever survived that trip. So yeah, uh, great video clip of them doing the lower log jams. All right, so it looks like we're arriving at our first log jam. We haven't seen a portage yet. Holy. It goes back forever. Do you lose the path or do you get a portage? You want to push? Can you hold it there for a second? Yeah. Thanks. So we're at a uh, portage, just at a log jam here, and it's a. Someone seemed to fail to mention that it was like a steep cliff. Hey. But this is what we're dealing with right now. No step. Yeah, at least it's not pouring rain anymore. We just went through a torrential downpour, but uh, now we have this guy to deal with. This is a log jam that we have to get around behind us. And this is the fun takeout again. Classic. We love classic steel river, steep clay, muddy put ins and takeouts. We're gonna miss it. Pow, pow. Chaplo Nimagasenda River. It's a great trip. And I don't think anybody does this trip anymore. Okay, so it is actually uh, just out of Chaplo. Chaplo is just northeast of Lake Superior, kind of northeast of Wawa. And uh, it was a big route back in the day. Uh, back in 1937, the uh, MNR had to go in and make a campground in the town of Elsass, right here at the rail town, because there were so many people canoeing that area. Uh, there were so many tourists going that, to that area. So kind of cool. Now, I don't think anybody battles it. So it starts off in the town of Chapleau, uh, Racine Lake. Uh, there was an outfitter at the time with a the campground there. They moved on and went to Quebec, and the, the Kippewa Lake area. I'm not sure if anybody's there now, but I do know that they sold off the place, so someone's got to be there. But the Shout Blow River is a really good river, water dependent. I mean, even if it's low water, you can still do it. You're just going to be walking for quite a bit. But there's lots of rapids. Not a lot of dangerous rapids, and there's portages around those rapids. Mind you, again, there, it, I don't think that route is being maintained by the government anymore, so you should be aware of that, but it's still a really good route. So you finally get to Cabasquissing Lake, which is like maybe two or three days or three days at least down the Chaplow River. 
really watch out for that lake. It's a very shallow lake, so when wind picks up, it's like, man, it, it is like uh, Lake Tamiskaming. It really, it, it just keep an eye on it, okay? And, um, yeah, so we paddled across that and got to the town of Elsass. I mean, Elsass, oh, boy, it, it was a big town at the time. It was created in 1912, and it was a, a big thing until the 1930s. It was a logging town. Lots of people living there. I think over 300 people. Uh, then after that, I think, um, oh my Lord, uh, I forget when they lived there, but there was actually only two people living there at the time. There's two guys. One was the sheriff and one was the, the mayor. They hated each other. There was a love triangle with, um, some woman. There was a, a, a death or a murder, depending who you talk to on the rail in between their two houses. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I met the one guy. He was still living there. The other guy moved out and then had a heart attack. But um, I met the one guy, and he was a collector of books. And in his uh, cabin was one of my books. He didn't say much to me, though. But there was also, when we went through, there was actually a bed and breakfast. Quigley's bed and breakfast. I don't think that exists anymore. But I, I know that, that the owner had died a, a few years back from cancer. But great guy. And... and uh, <laughs> He, he he brought us in. We I don't know. I think I gave him fifty bucks, and we we got one of those cabins up the hill. We stayed at and gave us some beer and uh, great. And um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure whatever happened to Ellis House, but I do know that I signed one of the paddles in their bar, which actually was a shack with a bunch of things like a billy bass fishing thing. I don't know. It was a weird bar, and I just signed a paddle, so it probably is still there. Yeah, so, you know, uh, big, a big thing and back in the 30s. There was a campground, lots of canoeists going down the Groundhog, going down the Capitalist Casing, going to Chaplow, Nimbuka It was a big place to go. And now, yeah, there's not much there at all. Here's the route. Uh, so Racine Lake, uh, we started there because that was where the outfitter was and where their campground was. And we went down the Chaplow River and then went to Capitalist Casing Lake and to Elsass and then Loop up the Nimbacassenda River, which really is not much of a river. It's more of a wetland area full of wild rice. And there's a couple of big drops along the way that you just portage around. But yeah, uh, that, that's what it. And what we did is we, we finished here. Um, you could loop all the way back to where we started, but we just ran out of time. And uh, we actually called the outfitter and then they put our vehicle there and we picked it up. This guy, John Mitchell, uh, who was John Mitchell? I remember, I'm pretty sure he was, first name was John anyway. He was a guy from the States and we met him along the way. And a uh, great guy. In fact, actually he dumped in some rapids um, going up the Nimbacassenda and I pulled him out and he, he suffered um, hyperthermia. We actually really had to take care of him. Yeah, visit him uh, a couple years later uh, in the United States. Uh, but yeah, he was on that trip. <laughs> Poor bugger. He was, he was uh, on a trip with a um, Berlin Kruger type canoe. It was a double, double blade type canoe. And back in the day, that was a unique thing. Uh, and he, his wife had left him. He had a, a child that was autistic and he was taking care of the child full time. His wife had left him. And then I think he had a girlfriend that he was going to give the canoe to. And then that didn't work out. So he just took the canoe and went on a solo journey. Uh, and yeah, great, good guy. And um he kept going. It was really funny. We, le we left uh, and went to a hotel in Chapleau. And um, he had a bear encounter that night. So, and it, it was fine. Like he dealt with it, whatever. But we actually had a worse encounter. We went to a hotel in Chapleau, uh, which is actually right beside the OPP uh, uh, police detachment. But they came and arrested the guy that was uh, beside us in the hotel. And he was wanted for murder. <laughs> so I think John was okay with the bear more than we were with the hotel okay right continue on okay quit back yeah so there's the uh, upper uh Nimbicacenda going up the Nimbicacenda it's not really a river it's more of a tranquil wetland area it's actually a really nice battle the only big drop I forget the name of the falls I don't think there was a name for the falls on the Nimbicacenda and except for John we saw no one we did see someone on the Chaplow River they were a bunch of canoeists that left a pile of garbage, actually. We reported them, but yeah. But 
that that's all we saw and i think it was i forget how long eight to 12 days it was it was a long trip walk me lake loop this has to be lost lost it was lost when i did it but i don't think anybody has done it since <laughs> but uh you know it was a good area i gotta say uh so we have you look at where we are we're actually north of uh lake huron uh, northeast of uh, Sault Ste. Marie, Lake Superior, and Wakami Lake Provincial Park is a nice campground, really nice campground that a lot of people don't go to. If you go there, you're probably just an angler trying to catch walleye out of Wakami Lake. Wakami Whalers, uh, great band. They're, they're still around, I think. Uh, but yeah, they uh, they originated from there because they were outdoor interpreters uh, at the time, I believe. I don't even have that program there anymore. But yeah, here's the loop. And it's a longish route. I think 100, 100 kilometers plus. Hugh Banks and I, uh, he was the biologist at the college I work at part-time. Uh, him and I went. And we just started at the provincial park itself, went down Wakami Lake, and then we went in, into a series of uh, liftovers and beaver dams and stuff, and then went into the Little Wakami River. Lots of history there in the past. There was a lot of, uh, there was an old trapping cabin. There was a lot of forest re remnants uh, back in the day. This railway was the main way to get there. There was POW camps put there from the World War II. Lots of history, but we didn't see anybody at all this entire trip and had a hard time even finding a campsite. But then we got to uh, the, the crossover here when we went up the Wakami River itself and back to Wakami Lake. And yeah, it was a good trip. Um, lining up the, the Wakami River itself, going across Wakami Lake. It was okay. There was actually a hiking trail too at one point. This probably still exists, but I don't know if I would ever do it. But there's a hiking trail that goes around that whole route, around Wakami uh, Lake as well. But but nobody goes there. So yeah, it's lost. Ranger Lake Loop. Oh my lord, I love this place. So when I was 12, I think 12, I have a sip of whiskey for this one. Uh, my dad, my dad would, would take me camping uh, every year and we, sometimes he would collect some money. He didn't have a lot of money. He was a professional boxer, but then worked at a factory for the rest of his life for 45 years, actually. And I don't think he ever liked that, the working at the factory, to be quite honest, but he did. So anyway, uh, his whole thing was uh, for him and I to go off on, on these, uh, these camping trips or fishing lodge trips. And one big thing was for us to fly into Megason Lake when I was 12 with my, my, um, my brother-in-law, um, Terry, and my uncle at the time. Um, yeah, so we went in there and, you know, I, I, I got to say that's the first time I went canoeing. Uh, I was 12 years old and we were on Megason Lake. We were catching a few lake trout, but we decided to go into some side lakes with a, an old um, Grumman canoe to try for brookies and caught amazing brook trip. So years later, I want to go back there and yeah, two things of that route. Well, three things really massive brook trout and lake trout, but massive brook trout, massive old growth pine that are still there to this day. Amazing. Ogoma is amazing for it. It's a huge white pine. And also you're not going to see anybody. Back in the 30s, 1930s, it was a very popular canoe trip, especially for Americans coming in. And I'm not sure why, but I got an old map from that area, uh, from the 30s, 1933 actually. And I followed the route from that. And uh, it's amazing. You look at the Ranger Lake Loop. We started at Gong Lake. Uh, I, I went with a filmmaker, uh, Kip again, and also... Um, this is Scott, the park planner, because you want to know about this area because they were thinking of making a park at the time. So you uh, you could start at Ranger Lake. We didn't. We started at, at, at Gong Lake. Now, we're lucky that road wasn't too bad, but I do know that it can get rough. And I'm going to go to a clip of, again, uh, of Jonathan. And Jonathan uh, was, was the one person that recently went on this. I got it say something here like so i'm showing clips of these youtubers that have done the trips previously no previously lately <laughs> and why my lord remember i did this book to promote these areas so they're not lost for me to actually see a bunch of young youtubers doing the route and then promoting it and even J jonathan actually showing 
the book that he's following is mine. Oh, that is incredible. I'm really excited for this trip. I'm doing the Ranger Lake Loop in Algoma. It's uh, not well traveled. I got it out of uh, Kevin Callan's Ontario's Lost Canoe Roots. And uh, I've just based on my research, it doesn't sound like it's well traveled at all. <laughs> Mosquitoes are coming out just in time for the trip. <laughs> it's May 14th, and uh, I've got up to two weeks to do this trip. Depends how hard I want to make it. We'll see. Show a quick overview of the route. So this is Ranger Lake here. I'm camped there. Heading up today into Samo Lake. And then through a few small lakes. Gong Lake, this is where I was trying to get to in the uh, with the access roads. But early, this is just after ISO, early spring is a bad time to be exploring forest roads. They're gonna be flooded and washed out, so. I have no signal here and I'm a little frightened. Okay, so I'm stuck. Uh, I have no signal. I have no idea what I'm going to do. I'm very far away from everything. <sighs> Shit. So I got out of that uh, and I don't have the nerve to try it again. That was dumb. Anyway, so where I wanna get to today is at the confluence of the, uh, I'm not gonna say it right, but Nishtugani, Nishtugani, anyway, and the West of Binidong. So these two rivers come together here. This portage here is another reason I was trying to avoid, or trying to get to here. Um, it says 900 meters, but uh, my reports say that whatever it is now, the portage, it's closer to three kilometers, so. If that's the case, um, that really sucks to have to do that both ways, but... Oh, and this is the book that this route is contained in, if you wanted to buy it, which you should. And, I, I mean, really, how to make your day, how to make your, your week, how to make your year, is to actually see young people paddling these routes, and hopefully they won't be lost. Yeah, so going back to the route, so, um, so yeah, Jonathan tried to do this road and then, you know, couldn't do it in early spring, so he went from Ranger Lake. Uh, and, yeah, I, so I never did this portage. It was noted as uh, 940, but he said it's three kilometers, and I, I, I'll believe him because he did it. I didn't. We went from here. We went uh, up the West Abitadong River, which is a slog, really. Um, wasn't maintained at all, but it was a good trip. Ah! and drowning upstream today. It's pretty hot out. And it's the only way to get there, so why not? I worked really hard to get here. That's my payback. It's fantastic. Uh, one should never underestimate the rewards of taking the road 
less travel. Went to Megasin Lake and the lodge that my dad and I stayed at, we flew in years ago, gosh, years ago, probably the se- late 70s, um, was still there, but it was abandoned. It was a ghost town. And um, I'm not sure if anything's there anymore. What we did from there, though, is we flew out uh, and went back to Gong Lake. Actually, that was a misadventure in itself. So we couldn't get the flight out originally planned because the pilot was arrested. <laughs> so I thank goodness I had a sat phone, but it didn't have much battery because the one guy that was canoe partner with Nancy Scott working for the government, he had used the phone quite a bit to phone his wife. Um, and we were running out of battery, but we did get another flight in two days later. All we had to eat at that time was prunes and some sugar. That was it for two days. And, uh, and some trout. <laughs> but anyway, that's, that's another story. But you could, which I've done before, amazing trip. You go actually loop through and go down the, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, but uh, Gani, no, no, Gani River. And yeah, uh, it's a great trip. Good brook trip fishing there as well, but lots of log jams and no maintenance whatsoever, but it's doable. Low water it, an issue as well, so just watch it for that, but it's still a, a doable trip and nobody maintains this route, okay, nobody. So um, when we got back to Gong Lake, uh, yeah, um, both our vehicles were, our tires were slashed. <laughs> so you might wanna look into that. Um, I remember writing a, an article on this whole thing was everybody you know thinks wilderness canoe tripping is dangerous. Well, yeah, it is with people. I mean, the only misadventure we had here was the, you know, the pilot being arrested uh, up here and also our tires being slashed down here, but wilderness didn't really kick her butt. We were fine. Oh, spectacular. Oh, no, no. <laughs> oh, wow. How about that, Brookie? That is a thing of beauty. All right. Go free, buddy. Oh. Oh. Beauty. Absolute beauty. That is beautiful. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, please get in this net. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. It just gets bigger every time. Look at that brookie. Look at him. Red belly. Oh wow. Oh, I can't help but admire them. They're absolutely stunning. Thank you, my friend. Thank you so much. Dunlop Lake Loop. Oh, my Lord, this is amazing. This is a mecca. My buddies, uh, for years, my high school buddies, we'd always go to Algonquin Park. And one year I said, come on, guys. We would not go to Algonquin Park. This year. We always go to Algonquin. Let's try somewhere different. So I looked at this Elliott Lake area, and it was a lost route of the time. It's somewhat maintained now because Elliott Lake really is promoting tourism. So I, I think there's more done in this route than there was when I first went there. Actually, I was there uh, just recently and actually, yeah, I just love the place still. It's amazing. The scenery is incredible. But yeah, um, the, um, the Dunlop uh, area, it was one of those pamphlets that got mailed to me and went there and I convinced them to go and they complained the whole entire time. Like, oh, this is such a long drive. It's like five hours. We'd be gone by now. It's like, well, whatever. Yeah, so yeah, deal with it. We went there. They loved it. We caught so many fish. Brook trout, splake, brookies, just amazing. Yes, the bugs are bad, and this is how you deal with the bugs. <laughs> but yeah, uh, amazing area. The one route that, uh, there's tons of routes to do. I mean, the one here, you can go from Flack Lake and make sure you, if you do that, go up to Old Baldy. It's amazing uh, scenery. And then do this loop here. But that's a little rugged. It's the, the, the portages are uphill. Uh, I do think they maintain them now though when we did that it was not maintained but the main route uh that i would suggest is go from uh the main launch just north of elliott lake near just north of the tim hortons in town and go down through dunlop lake and go into 10 mile lake and then go up to upper mace which is an incredible lake and i won't tell you where the fish are but they're they're there 
I know there's a secret on that lake, but I'm not going to tell you. Sorry. <laughs> and you go through Lily Pad Lake into Lower Mace, which is actually an even nicer lake. You could go into Pathfinder Lake and a whole bunch of other side lakes uh, as well and do some bushwhacking through, through there for some brook trout and or not and then uh claim lake beautiful campsite right there on a, on a point and actually that's an island on the point and then you uh go uh do a 1300 which it seems long but it's actually relatively easy portage and then go through dunlop it's an amazing trip so yeah um w what happens to a lot of us is like we're we're thinking of gonquin is far north well and and if you go to Elliott Lake, oh my gosh, we're going to be driving all the time. It's worth the drive. And it's not even a long drive, guys. It's only like five or six hours. Like, do it. It's an amazing place. Black Ensemble, Bark Lake Loop. Okay, Bisco Tasing, uh, Mississauga, Mississauga River. I can go on and on about this area. I love this area. I go paddling there all the time. It's amazing. But I wanted to do a shortcut into Bark Lake because Gray Owl's cabin. So Gray Owl was uh, Archie Blaney. Uh, he was... Uh, uh, English guy that moved to Canada because of some life issues he had and then it was a was a ranger uh, in this area and that was one of his cabins he kept along the way then he masqueraded as a First Nations person uh, for many years wrote as Grey Owl and everybody thought he was First Nations probably not the First Nations people they probably thought they knew his hoax but they kept quiet and um, he did a lot I mean the whole saving of the beaver um when you, you have a nickel the the beaver on the nickel is because he actually saved the beaver from extinction so he did a lot of good uh but he also was not a first nations person and then the media uh, this would never happen today but they held off because of all the good they were doing because the north bay nugget i think it was knew he was a fraud but they didn't say anything until he died and then he then he died and then they told everyone oh by the way you know he's archie blaney he was never Grail. because he did so much good um they really nobody really well we, we still praise him all right cheers grail all right to go into uh his cabin uh the quick way you go into lakasabal into bark lake so you go down uh the road uh was it five thirty three i think Anyway, so you, you go up from, from there from the main highway. The road gets really rough after you leave Richie Rich Resort, or Richie Falls Resort. It gets really rough. It's all doable there. I mean, pe people even camp here on Crown Land for, for a bit with uh, RVs, so it's not too bad. But it's, you know, <laughs> it's, it, it's rough. So you head out from uh, Lakasaba Lake, go down these series of lakes into Bark Lake, incredible campsite there on a, on a massive uh, beach with huge red pine which is really you know red pine are not really dominant in this area so to see them there's incredible huge red pine in this area as well there was a forest fire i forget the year that it happened probably in the 40s or 50s headed down and it stopped at this point here and so all the big pine here lived and uh you've got to experience it it's incredible the the, the pine in there is just incredible so Bark Lake. So what we did is we camped here and then spent some days paddling around uh, Bark Lake, which is incredibly massive. And if you read Grey Owl's, uh, I forget the book actually, sorry. Um, hmm, uh, that He describes this area and it's the same to, to this day. So there's the cabin. It's in a private area, a uh, private, it, it, my dog, my dog's snoring. My dog's snoring. It is midday. Well, late, I think. But she's snowing. She's getting old. Anyway, uh, yeah, the cabin is, is on private property. It's a, a lodge that I've never seen anybody at. It's locked. Um, supposedly he signed the inside of it. It's nothing special. Like, really, the landscape itself is special. The cabin's not. So don't worry about it. But, yeah. Um, and then you could go back the same way which i've done more so than the other but i think i've only twice i've actually gone the other way you can go through these series of ponds and small creeks to, to make it a loop again it's not maintained we found these roots by like a beer can on a stick or a shotgun shell whatever that's how we found the portages along here and i don't think that has changed i don't think anybody's maintaining it so just be aware of that but yeah it's well worth it i love that trip i do that in a heartbeat Navi 
Nebequesi route. There was two routes here that the uh, MNR district back in the day would would mail you pamphlets for. Um, I don't know if they're maintained. I I would say no. They're not probably not maintained at all. They might be used by the local people, but I don't think anybody does these. The Nebequesi and the 4M Circle Loop. The Nebequesi is on the east side of of Gogama. And um, I, I like this area because I used to work in forestry up there. So I really like this area. It's just uh, southwest of Timmins. Yeah, so here's the route. And that's Mr. Baxter, my canoe buddy that I've been paddling with for a long time. And I, I always thought our first trip was in Quetico. We went out for 28 days in Quetico. But that's not our very first trip. Our very first trip was actually this route in Abiquasi. Didn't know him. He was a neighbor of mine. And I saw that he had a canoe and I had a canoe. We just chatted and headed up to Nabiquasi. So you started the, in the town at the public launch and you do a you, you go up a, up a series of uh two rivers well there, i would say creeks more than rivers this is not maintained at all we, uh, we we got to this one lake here and there were some local fishing guys at a at a cabin and they told us to get off their effing lake i went this is not your lake and um it was funny andy at the time was working for well he still works for the ministry of natural resources but at that time, he was working for the conservation officer program, and we knew they were poaching. So I had a sat phone at the time, which back then, that was a big thing. And we called them. Uh, they, they got in a b- bunch of trouble. And the one guy was, um, I think he was the, I think he was the chief of police. <laughs> anyway, they got in a lot of trouble. So this creek here is full of log jams and liftovers. And then we went down uh, the one river, Donnegama River, which is just a, like a swamp. And it went into Nabiquasi. To to characterize Nabiquasi, it's more swampish like. So I remember reeling in a brook trout at the, at the rapid here where we camped, and then a pike grabbed it. So to characterize what the river is kind of like, you got brook trout and northern pike. Then we get up to uh, the main river itself, and we had to go up to this this river here. This section here um, was an old road that had a whole bunch of logs down on it. There was a wind blowing, a whole bunch of poplar trees. So we actually went around this way. I hope this is still open. If not, this still should be open. Yeah, that's the lower portion. So yeah, it's a river, but it's not. It's just a swampy area with lots of moose and nobody. That's the river itself. That's actually where I cut the brook trout. In the, no, yeah, I was I cut a brook trout and then the pike rabbit. Lost them both. Story of my life. 4M Circle route. This is right across the road. And it's another route that I don't think anybody does. Good walleye fishing, I tell you that. And um, here it is here. So you basically start off at Dividing Lake. And you head down through a series of small lakes. Really shallow lakes too, but good fishing. Lots of bald eagles. And then back up through here. Not much to say except, yeah, if you want to a route that nobody really goes on that's lost and it's going to take a little bit of work but not too much when we did it that's the only sign we saw of the route there's no portage signs no nothing uh and we we're lucky to actually i don't know why that sign was there but at least we knew where we were at the time <laughs> that's before bringing a gps by the way really good fishing the Tata Chada, <laughs> the Tata Chada bit. Oh my lord! I'm always, oh, the 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 Tata, the Tata Chada Pico River. Ah, there I said it. And uh, this is an incredible trip. Well, when I did it, it was incredible. I I know Brad uh, Jennings uh, recently did it, and I'll show the video. Uh, and it was burned all over. So um, it's totally different now. But you know, the river's still there. Forest is different, but the river's still there. And again, this is one that I got a pamphlet from the government. I don't think they, well, I know they don't maintain this route at all as a canoe route, but it, it, it was a canoe route. Well, it still is a canoe route by, by law. If it's a navigable waterway as a canoe route, and if we keep pushing people to go on it, they're not going to touch it for any other purpose except for us to paddle it. So keep paddling these rivers. That's what I'm saying. So there's sections of the river that are windy, bendy, especially the upper part, uh, not many rapids at all, but then you get into some, some great rapids and Brad's video shows him doing it in the early spring. I mean, gosh, there was snow still on the ground and ice still in the lakes, whatever, but yeah, so, uh, but it's not like that all the time. It's more of a, 
grind. There's lots of rapids that you can run, but you you know bring a, a old beat, beat up canoe. Don't don't bring a brand new canoe on this one. You start off at Tadachikapika Lodge and do a shuttle. You basically go down the river, and we stopped at the bridge here at uh, 144 just before Timmins. Or the road goes up to Timmins, but you could actually paddle all the way to Timmins. In fact, I, I did this river um, after the fact uh, and put out at the uh, Wendy's um, at Timmins. Pulled out my canoe <laughs> back behind Wendy's. I'm not sure if that's even there anymore, but. But yeah, you, you might want to put out there. I mean, this it gets into a sort of a mundane part uh, after the fact. When you do this trip, note the tributary is coming in the river if you want to catch brook trip. I'm not going to say too much, but all I know is if you can find a tributary coming into the river, especially on the lower end, go up that tributary and fish for brookies. That's all I got to say. Yeah. Brad has done amazing stuff towards Lost Canoe Roots. Uh, almost obsessive, to be quite honest, uh, since he was a kid with his dad. Now he works for the m &R, uh, up in Timmins and is still pursuing his dream to uh, explore and also document these canoe routes. This is an amazing route. I mean, it is a Lost Canoe Route and it is quite haunting with all these uh, matchstick forests, all the dead trees, but it's pretty awesome. Some gnarly white water, Great scenery, and it's just unique. You gotta do this route. Most of the trails are decimated by blowdowns or wildfires, you name it, or just lack of use. So you gotta use a bit of sleuthing and detective work to figure out what's on the ground and if you're actually on the historic canoe route. Keep an eye out for nails that were nailed to trees. There might be old tattered pieces of um, signs that are still hanging to the trees, very tiny remnants of it. Old remnants of a sign right there, pretty cool. Look for a small little indent into the ground where people have trodden over the years. You might see bits of rotting wood that have been, have a slow depression. Even with roots, there might be a slight depression as trees bend away as well too from where people used to traverse the area. Look for small openings and look for old blazes as well. You might find newer ones and the old ones look like a gnarled, curled over spot. But it's essentially a spot on a tree that has been blazed, i.e. cut by an ax, to kind of guide your way along on the portage trail. Rapids ahead. And really, like if it wasn't for him and the other people, the other paddlers that are doing these lost canoe routes, um, you know, they would continue to be lost. So uh, yeah, check out his channel. He's a really good guy. Chinikinchu River. Oh my Lord. Okay, whiskey for that one.
when I went up there and wrote about the Chinaguchi, the reason why is I knew this area really well. I paddled here a lot back in the day. I still do. I love this area. One of my favorite areas. It looks like Killarney, the, the Colosh Quartzite Mountains, but it's not. It's actually Crown Land or, you know, a possible park right now. And when I wrote about it, a lot of canoeists were like, oh, I'll kill you, Callan. I'll kill you. You wilderness pornography, you? You're telling everybody where this place was? So a, a while ago, I was uh, paddling this route, and uh, I noticed on Wolf Lake some mining deposits, that they, the cores. Basically, they, some uh, geologists were, or whatever they're called, basically looking for gold. And I know that because I work at part-time, I teach part-time at San Francisco College, and I know the geologists there, and they, they basically, yeah, well, they, th those, those whole core digs are in quartz, especially, they're looking for gold deposits. I went, oh, crap, if they find gold here, you can kiss this place goodbye. So I wrote about it. And I thought if I write about it, people will come here and try to protect it. There's old growth pine there. There's old growth hemlock there. Uh, it's a beautiful area to paddle. It was actually the most southern access point to Tomogamy back in the day. The First Nations people, that's how they got to Tomogamy. It's through this area, not from the other. Um, yeah, huge history. And it's just beautiful, right? Paradise Lagoon. So I wrote about it. Oh, and some paddlers just, you, wilderness pornographer, you, devil, like you shouldn't have done that. It's like, whatever. Yeah, you know what? Curse me all you want. But I know, I know if we don't, then they're going to mine gold here. And sure enough, uh, because of the pressure there, they actually made a waterway park there. But went that one lake that they found gold in, they're like, oh, maybe we should just lift that part of the park out of there and then mine for gold. And huge controversy right now is going on. Uh, people are fighting for it, for, fighting for the gold or fighting for the, the park itself. And yeah, I'm glad I told everybody about it. Okay, Chinaguchi. So I wouldn't say this is a lost canoe route anymore. It's packed uh, full of people. Don't go on the weekend, especially Wolf Lake, which is why I wanted to write about it, which I, I saved the route and everything else. I think it's fantastic. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. So you start off at Metogamy Lake, which is an amazing lake. Good fishing, by the way. Don't tell anybody, good fishing for, uh, for walleye and bass. Anyway, you go up there, and then you won't really see the, the Lacloche quartzite hills until you get to this about three-quarters across the lake, and then all of a sudden it'll look like Killarney Provincial Park. Uh, Paradise Lagoon, which by history you have to go and swim in naked. You don't have to. I'm just saying that is the thing. So you go up through a series of lakes here into Chinaguchi Lake, which is an incredible place, actually. In fact, actually, a really good trip is just go up to Chinaguchi Lake and come back the same way. But you could go uh, into uh, McConnell Bay, which is an amazing sand beach campsite, incredible place. And then Laurel Lake, and I, I got to tell you, though, portaging for Laurel Down, it, it's a mud bath. The portage, it, it's just blah. This one right here, uh, it's just, yeah, money, money, money. But then you go down through these Sears Lakes, really good fishing too, by the way. Don't say, well, I mean, it's like quartzite and it's, Aqua blue water, so a lot of lakes are actually dead. There's no fish in them, but some do have fish, and when they do have fish, like Evelyn Lake, I said too much. Um, it's really good. So they head down to uh, to um, uh, Otogamy Lake as well. There's native paintings there. There's there's only a couple. They're really hard to see, but they're there, and that makes a really good route. Okay, but this is not a lost canoe route anymore. It's a waterway park. They're fighting for the rights of it instead of gold. There's so many people going there that people are cursing me. That was the reason why I wrote the book. Just saying. There's the beautiful quartz shoreline. Amazing lake. And a lot of people love it. Tomogamy's Canton Lake. Oh my lord. Okay, so I, I got in Tomogamy uh, through one of the and also my, my own self too. And uh, this was a route that I was told about and I guided a group on this route because I didn't know anything about it. Here we are there going to Bob Lake with a group. Oh my lord, look at me. John Denver classes and everything. Rocky Mountain High. And this group here was frigging amazing to be with. I don't know where they are now, but man, I love that trip. They were amazing people. So yeah, Big Pine, Mighty Portages, Lost Canoe Route for sure. You start off at uh, Ferguson Bay, uh, where Camp Bonapate is. Um, that 
this road is fine until you get here. Then you're like, oh my God, I can't do it. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. It's all doable, but really watch it. That's just a nasty bit of road. But yeah, there's a parking spot there. And yeah, you basically head down here and go uh, from Ferguson Bay into Sharp Rock Inlet. This is the North Shore of Lake Tomogamy, by the way, Ferguson Bay and Sharp Rock Inlet. And then this is where the lost part is. And this was a route that was used, but not many people use and still not many people use. But what's great about it is that it's, it's tough. I mean, those portages are, a lot of them are up, up a steep incline. But you get into Bob Lake, and Bob Lake is just absolutely amazing. And from Bob Lake, though, you do a day, day I mean, so you camp at Bob Lake for two nights. That's the best campsite right there if you get it. Uh, and you head up into Obabaca and do the whole, um, well, you go into this lake, which is, um, is where they did a lot of vision quests, but also this is where the old growth trail is. So you basically walk the trail where the old growth pine is in Obabaca and Tomogamy. And that's your back way in from Bob Lake. And then you go back to your campsite and you loop back. And this portage is the longest, but it's really easy. It's flat. And then you go to Diamond Lake. I probably would second guess camping on Diamond Lake. Um, a lot of the camps that go into Mogami, they finish or start their trip in Diamond Lake. So bears know that. So if you're going to have a bear problem, it's going to be on Diamond Lake, I think. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so, anyway, go from Diamond Lake back into Sharp uh, Rock Inlet and also uh, go across the uh, Napoleon Portage, which is pretty darn steep, to be quite honest, and finish off at Camp Palomite. And amazing trip. Martin River. Not much to say about this. Probably isn't a lost route anymore. Maybe for paddlers or canoeists. It's a place where a lot of motorboats go to, to fish for a walleye in the spring. But it's a great place to go just to, I mean, it's a non-operating area of the park too. So there's no fee structure for it. So yeah, um, it's just a beautiful place I go to a lot. I, I, I just want to you know, get away, where to go. I'm going to go to Martin Lake. I shouldn't say Martin Lake, I should say Wixie Lake. Martin Lake Provincial Park is a nice park, but it's right across the road from it. So there's an access point, um, Martin Lake here as well, right there. But basically, yeah, Wixie Lake. And I would just go to Wixie Lake. There's a bunch of places you can go to. You can go up to here and we'll see really anybody up here. But just keep, keep to Wixie. There's tons and tons of island campsites to, to explore. Really good place. So the South River, uh, yeah. Uh, if you're a huge history buff with the Tom Thompson group of seven, a lot of people say that, you know, he went into Algonquin through the Canoe Lake area. And yeah, he spent a lot of time there, but this was his main entrance, the South River. He would take the train up into the town of the South River and then paddle up in here. And this is where he explored a lot. It painted a lot. So I thought I would explore this route. And this is how you do it. You basically start at uh, Quigmog Lake, or I think most people call it Round Lake, and you head up into uh, North T and do these portages that it is a, it is in the Algonquin park. So you need a permit and everything else, but I don't know anybody that does this area here at all. Uh, but yeah, you go into here. Um, and then from there though, whoops, oh, oh, go back here. Whoops. Oh, great. From there, you actually go down the Craig Creek uh, into the South river and then take the South river all the way back to the town of the South river. And that's the historic route. I mean, they all went upriver, but you're going down. And it's just a bunch of gravelly rapids, brook trout as well. Um, POW camps, World War II camps, uh, where they, they where we put the soldiers uh, back in the day. And um, yeah, it's a really good route. I wouldn't say it's a loop, it's a U-shaped. So you have to do a, a shuttle, but there's no outfitter in town, no problem. And yeah, it's a route that I don't think a lot of people have done. And, won't do but tom thompson his main way to get into a algonquin park to paint his paintings was actually this route it was not the south end or the oxton area in canoe lake and yes it's not maintained so good luck to you <laughs> all right last one york river you got to do this one it's amazing and it's so easy to do but nobody pals it it is uh it is near bancroft and which is just south of algonquin park uh, and what you do is you go to Egan Lake Provincial Park, which is not really a provincial park. There's a, there's a parking lot there that really, <laughs> and there's a whole bunch of waterfalls. I think there's three chutes that you go um, and portage around. This is amazing for if you're a rock hound 
for minerals. There's a ton, tons of minerals there to search out for. But yeah, yeah, you go down the York, York River, which is just a meandering river. Um, the only portages really are at the beginning around the falls, and then you meander, and there's a whole bunch of sand beaches you can camp at. There's no designated campsites. But anyway, you uh, go down the, the York River. There's a bit of rapids in high water um, by, by the, the bridge here, so just watch it there. And then you go into Conway Marsh, which is actually one of the, the group of seven. Uh, uh oh, I forget. Oh, what group of seven painted there? I forget. But this is an amazing place. And you head up into um, the town of Cumbermere, uh, where the Madawaska River is, and you finish the trip. I did do a trip. I didn't document though, but you could do this and then go up the Little Mississippi River, which is a lost, lost canoe route. I would do that in early spring, but that's an incredible trip too. And so many other places to go. I can go on and on and on, but I just wanted to keep it to the book, the Lost Canoe Route book, so you know which routes I'm talking about and how you can get information on that. And there's my dog, oh, Bailey. And Lord, she jumped into the river at the top of the falls and almost went over the falls and almost died. The main reason I, I did this presentation is just to get you to go and do these routes. I mean, the whole philosophy of the, of the book when I did this back in, the, in 2002, is to make sure these roots are used, utilized, so nobody else uses them for anything else, like resource extraction or whatever. And it's such an incredible thing to actually see that some of them are overwhelmed, overused. <laughs> some of them become parks, managed parks. Some haven't at all, so we need some work on that. But the greatest thing ever is to see a bunch of other people, other paddlers, like these young YouTubers that, that I've seen, do these roots and keep promoting them. It's the biggest pleasure, in unbelievable. You can never imagine in my mind how excited I am to actually see that because at that time, I thought these routes were done and uh, they're not. And the, f the future looks promising. Awesome, cheers everybody. Where are we headed? Just up a little portage. So you have to watch or your feet might get wet in in some of the you know goopy places. So be careful where you step.